activation and a lot of the Andy Kaplan and Petit's work in the 90s and 2000s that really kind of set the stage for understanding how the virus um, after budding um, changes from its immature form to the mature form. And uh, Ron's contributions have been really amazing in terms of understanding exactly where the protease, which is an enzyme that gets activated in the HIV, uh, cuts this lattice. So um, there have been phenomenal um, 20 years that um, has seen a lot of Ron's publications. And accordingly to that, Ron has acquired a lot of awards. He has, been, he has had the NIH Merit Award from 2005 to 2015. And then he became distinguished professor um, at the Department of Biochemistry and Biophysics in Chapel Hill from 2014. And um, aside from 
all of this, I think that every, all of us who work in HIV really kind of feel this presence in the, uh, in the in HIV uh, field and really appreciate this wisdom that he has accumulated over the years. So it's been a really great pleasure for myself and people in my group and our new community to interact with him today. And um, I hope that some of that is shared with you know, everybody in visit. So thank, thank you so you. much for coming. Thank you. I, I did ask for you asked for a microscopic introduction, but I yeah, I, I asked for a short one. But, um, <laughs> nothing like a hard one to live up to. Uh, so it has been. It's a it's the only time in my life I'm going to talk to a physics department. So um, I'd be happy to field questions at any point. I'd, I'd much rather have everybody at least get the thread of what I'm trying to talk about and not feel like I've gotten too deep into something that's not interesting. Uh, then just have me go through and, and have you feel like. You sat through it, and it was a waste of time because I didn't try very hard. So, so please feel free to stop me at any time and ask any question. I, I'm always amazed that people qualify their questions with, I know this is going to be stupid, and then it's some question you hadn't even thought of, or it's something that you should have said and didn't. So please please feel free to stop me. I, the talk's in three parts, and so if, if we go too slow in one of the parts, we can just skip another part. Um, it's, it's been a treat to get to, to know Savitz over the last few years. Uh, and I, you'll see in this talk that I also uh, have enjoyed knowing Wes Sunquest, who's here in the audience for a long time now. And, um, and you'll see some of the influence, including some of his slides in my talk, because uh, this is a talk that I haven't given before, and so um, these parts of it. So it was easier to get slides from Wes and some of it than to try to make them myself. So, I am going to talk about proline today, not so much of it as a chemical structure, and, and most of you will, will recognize this as the as building block for proteins, the amino acids. Here's glycine, uh, where it has an, a hydrogen at this point, and the other amino acids are characterized by having different chemical structures here that we call R groups. Um, and what you'll see that's unique in proline is that what would otherwise be a fairly unremarkable side chain of carbons coming out, and we, we have some amino acids that are not quite, but close to this structure. But this one is now bent back and formed a bond with this nitrogen that's part of the, the backbone of the amino acid. So it's, it's constrained, which has something, has a big impact on protein structure, but it also changes the nature of this nitrogen right here. And other than pointing out that it's a special amino acid that has some special properties, I'm actually gonna leave it behind and just call it proline or P or pro or something like that. And, and kind of leave the chemical structure behind. Now, knowing Wes all this, these years, uh, Wes and I share an interest in basketball. And also, it's in my contract at UNC, which is a little bit basketball crazy, but I have to have a basketball reference in my talk. So, so this is not your stadium. Um, but th and you'll notice, I got this off the web, and for the life of me, that sure looks like a, a traveling UNC team in light blue. Um, this is Assembly Hall in Indiana, Bloomington, Indiana. And it's not, so I went looking for Assembly Hall. And the reason is that I think of University of Utah as the, uh, really the home of our understanding of how virus, uh, how HIV and actually other viruses to assemble. And so uh, all of what I know uh, about Assembly has, has sort of come through uh, the University of Utah. So here's my attempt at University Hall, or Assembly Hall. and. Then I looked up the uh, most famous bas basketball player at University of Indiana, which is a guy named Isaiah Thomas. And so if I think about who's done the most training over a long period of time here, I would think it would be Wes. And that makes the mentor here, Wes Sunquist, a guy named Bobby Knight, who's famous for throwing chairs at basketball games. So you know, it was just too close of an analogy to pass up. So I had to, had to bring it along. But the, the real analogy I want to use is this one, which we'll kind of use through the talk. And I'm sure all of you will quickly recognize the important intersection of Interstate 80 and Interstate 15 here. And um, if we think of Interstate 80 as the flow of information about virus budding, <laughs> and uh, we think of Interstate 15 as the flow of information about the cell machinery, it really does intersect here at, at uh, University of Utah in Salt Lake City. And so it's fun for me to talk about our little part of this. 
um, at a place that is, is really has spent so much energy and, and so, so successfully uh, understanding how viruses spread. But it would be crazy for me to try to travel either of these highways, and I'm, I'm sure everyone must be familiar that there must be great traffic jams right here. So, so it would be crazy for me to try to get onto that. So what we're going to do is go on some back roads and byways. I actually bought this book for a friend of mine who retired recently, and she said she wanted to go travel out west. So I bought this book uh, and gave it to her because uh, I actually appreciate your state very much. So we're going to use a little bit of a travel log to get through our three parts. And the, the, the travel log itself doesn't have anything to do with the parts, but I, many of you will recognize this as uh, Capitol Reef, which is one of my favorite places in the world. Um, so we'll use that as the starting off point for a complete non sequitur, which is HIV assembly and budding. So these are the uh, parts that we're going to talk about. Those of you who work on HIV, they're very familiar. Uh, the, the rest of you, what's important to know is that HIV assembles with a precursor, a large precursor protein. And we're going to spend the whole day talking about this precursor protein and properties of the precursor protein. Uh, and it's a precursor because the final version of the virion does not look like this. This is what happens if you assemble the precursor. Uh, you can see all these things are still stuck together. All these little balls are stuck together. Um, and so virions can assemble with this precursor protein, which we call GAGA, kind of an odd name with an interesting history. But to break up this precursor, you need something that breaks proteins, and that's a protease. So there's an important protease that's embedded in an extension of this precursor that occurs sometimes in the cell. So there's mostly this, which you can think of as sort of the bricks and mortar of building the virion. And then the enzymes are in an extended precursor version, and the enzymes are involved in replication. And then one of those features is to break up all of these precursors into proteins that are now active to allow the virion to become an infectious particle. The pieces are, are pretty minimal in that you have, you can see that there's an envelope, a membrane around the virus. So you have to have a, something that targets the virus to the envelope, which is called the matrix. You have to build the virion, which we'll get to later. Here it's in the, the, the uh, precursor form, but there's the capsid protein, which builds the virion. And then there's a nucleocapsid protein, which binds the viral RNA, which gets recruited into the virus particle. And then a protein that's especially famous around here, uh, which is involved in budding, it just is called P6 for its size. So this is the this place where we're going to start. Here's the precursor. And one of the things we're going to talk about is how you break up all these parts with the protease. And here is the viral protease. Um, it's actually a pretty small protein. It's only 99 amino acids long. And it dimerizes, it homodimerizes and has these two aspartic acids here, which they're negatively charged, and they coordinate a water molecule right there. And that water molecule is added across a peptide bond. So you hydrolyze the peptide bond with that water molecule that's held right here. Here you can see an inhibitor bound to the protease. And that's actually a hydroxyl group coming down to engage those uh, negatively charged uh, aspartic acids. And that's part of the power of the protease inhibitors is that they can, they can fool the enzyme in thinking that it's right in the middle of adding water across this peptide bond and binds that structure really tightly and makes them really good inhibitors. But you can see that there's a, an active site here that, where the chemistry goes on. And then there's the inhibitor or a, a substrate that's going to bind in the protease. And what you'll see along the way is that to decide which bonds to break, the protease actually has to read the protein. And it does so with the, the sides of the enzyme in here where it decides what's the right uh, sequence to cleave, and then has this sort of generalizable mechanism for breaking a specific peptide bond. Okay. And so this is what the assembly process looks like. Um, and again, this is really the intersection of Interstate 15 and Interstate 80 right here. Uh, you have these precursor proteins that are budding at the membrane. These purple things are a viral protein on the outside that's going to target it to the next cell, but we're worried about the inside. Then you can see the, the short and the long versions, the long versions carrying the enzymes that are important for replication. A virus particle budding off, 
uh, and then ultimately the mature particle with this cone-shaped structure uh, and a rearrangement of both the, the interior structure and then also the processing to give you the smaller forms of the, the proteins. And here in a in kind of another diagrammatic form, which actually makes a really important part that um, I was amazed to learn this when folks like Wes figured this out, that you actually butt off, to a large extent, this immature structure, um, chop up all the proteins, the proteins kind of float around, and then there's an excess number of proteins. Here you can see the RNA bond to the nucleocapsid, but the capsid proteins are in excess. And so you can form this capsid protein out of this the soup and still have extra ones left over. And this will actually become important at the end of the talk. So this is how you make a virus particle. You start with this precursor. You have a protease that chops everything up. And then you take those pieces and reform them. Now, I'll note that this blue molecule here, this blue protein here, is stuck on the membrane. Even after the capsid is cut away from it, it stays at the membrane. That's the matrix protein. And that will also become important later. And now let me just share a couple of Wes's slides with you. Uh, this is Kraliam that Wes uh, did with a colleague, Grant Jensen. Uh, and you can see the immature particle with, where it can just barely make up the array of the proteins along the edge in the absence of processing. And then you can see this cone-shaped uh, structure here in the mature virion where you've had processing and a rebuilding of this cone-shaped thing. And uh, then it's also nice to pay homage to Wes. He figured out that with some very familiar structures of six-sided features and five-sided features, you could make this cone using symmetry elements that are well familiar, very familiar in viruses. Okay. So a long time ago, we, we sort of stumbled on the, the viral protease. And, you know, I'm embarrassed to, to see how long ago this was. Um, oh, actually, I don't even know how to get rid of that. Oh, well, just have to ignore it. Um, there are a lot of very talented uh, protein chemists out there who would purify large amounts of viral particles and do uh, N-terminal sequencing of the viral proteins that were present. And doing that, they could then figure out what the cleavage sites were, because all of these N-terminal pieces were, in fact, the remnants of the protease cleaving the larger protein into segments. So once you knew what the N-terminus was or the processed proteins, you could then infer what the cleavage site must have been. And so we didn't do that. A lot of other people did that. But we got to look at all these sequences, and we realized that there were kind of two classes. So, and they were determined by the P1 amino acid. Actually, um, well, that's, so that, uh, <laughs> I hadn't thought about that. Um, it's actually, the P1 amino acid is the one that's upstream of the cleavage site. So that's the one that becomes the C-terminus. The story, yeah, this is very interesting. I'm glad I, too bad I didn't look at this more carefully since it was so long ago. It's actually the P1 prime amino acid, which is on the other side of the cleavage site that becomes the key part of this story today. But we actually, in this paper, we had substituted in a lot of requirements uh, for the P1 amino acid. But these two types actually refers to the P1 prime amino acid, which we'll go through in great uh, detail. But here you can see that one of the key things that we noticed in looking at these sequences that the amino terminal cleavage site of the major capsid protein, so when the protease cleaves and it leaves two proteins now, the, uh, the end of the capsid protein um, is always represented by, uh, determines one of these two classes, which is actually a proline. And that's part of what makes prolines sexy. So the two classes here and the end terminus of the capsid protein is always a proline. And we didn't know why. Uh, we, and we never found out why, but you'll see what it does. But you can see what happens now. Um, when you look at cleavage of the GAG precursor, so here's the proteins that we just talked about, and now we're going to use the protease to cleave them all. What was clear is that there's this proline right at the cleavage site between matrix and capsid. Now, one of the things we did along the way was to ask, which, what's the relative rates of the cleavage of the different sites by the viral protease? And we found that the first site that's cleaved is right here next to NC. So that's the fastest site. And one of the questions we're gonna try to deal with is what determines the rate of processing? Okay, so this is the fastest one. And then you can see the one with the proline here is cleaved sort of at a second rate along with this site over here. And then finally, these two proteins 
with, that represent little tails get cut off and you wind up with the final products. Now the other thing I want to point out here, which is a key part of why there's a proline here, and I'll show you on the next slide, is that when you make this cleavage here, this part of the capsid protein, which you see does exist in two domains, this part changes conformation. And that's actually a thing that will run through also at the very end. And this is then work straight from Wes that shows now the capsid protein, this amino terminal domain of the capsid protein. Here's that proline at the number one position after cleavage. And this is the cleavage site over here showing the capsid, the matrix stuck up at the membrane here. And there's this extended region that represents the processing site. And when you cleave that and now create this new end of the protein, it folds back on itself and it makes a salt bridge right here, an ionic interaction that creates these new hairpins up here that uh, help change the conformation of the protein, change its, inter its properties interacting with each other, uh, and it represents a real important transition. And the fact that this proline is widely conserved among retroviruses tells you that this is a process that goes on. It's sort of fundamental to how retroviruses assemble and, re and rearrange at, with the, in the course of processing their precursors to give a, another conformation of this protein that has different and importantly different properties. So we'll come back to this again at the very end of what, why those properties are important. So let's go back to here and say that there are three sort of general rates. There's the fast, the medium, and the slow. And ask a question about why are they different rates? And we can note that by saying what makes this one the fastest one? And then with a proline here, which itself is problematic for a cleavage site because it's constrained, um, it turns out that this is actually, even though it's the medium rate, it's really fast for having a proline there with the viral protease. Sorry, how fast is fast? Um, it depends on the assays. Uh, the, sort of the fastest difference we've ever measured is about tenfold difference in rate. But it's uh, in different assays, it won't be as fast as that. But there's always this order. Okay. And what happens in the virion? I don't really know. I think, I think this is probably the first one. It's, uh, the, and these tails are definitely slow to come off. Whether there's more order than that and whether the order is actually important or sort of stochastic and it, in the end it doesn't matter, I actually don't know. And I have to teach you, so offer you some terminology. Um, so this is, this is what it looks like if you're looking at the protease, the two halves of the dimer. These are called flaps. They come down on the substrate. And here's a substrate in there. So what we're going to do is we're going to look down now and see what the substrate looks like in the protease and see what the protease is reading to figure out which bonds to cut. And this arrow is meant to represent the bond that's going to be cut. And it's called the sisal bond. Um, and so what you see now, here's this terminology, P1 kind of going upstream to the left and proteins are uh, polar in that there's something, the N terminal end is up here, the C terminal end is down here, so it has an order. So going upstream from this cleavage site, it's called P1, P2, P3, and P4. So you can align all sites. It doesn't matter what the amino acids are, the one just upstream is always the P1 amino acid not to be confused with the proline at position one. So P1 here means something different than what it does mean here. So after this, here the proline is in the P1 prime site going in the other direction. And just to confuse you, after the cleavage, this becomes the number one amino acid, which can be abbreviated as P for proline, and it becomes P1 proline in the capsid. But in the cleavage site, it's the P1 prime position because it's downstream of the cleavage site, then the next amino acid is P2, P3, and P4 is left off here. Now, each one of these positions, P1 prime, P2 prime, P3 prime, has a corresponding region in the protease that's essentially reading it. And we call those the subsites. So the P2 side chain is read in the S, or P2 prime uh, side chain is read by the S2 prime subsite. So it corresponds one to one. The P3 prime side chain is read by the S3 prime subsite. Okay, so that's the terminology. There's actually a, it's really interesting when I saw this slide, 
there's a mistake in it. It's, it's actually correct, except in the structure. And, and uh, I'll shake the hand of anyone who knows it, remembers it and spots it. OK. The challenge in this is in, in some viruses that have processing sites, the processing site has elements that's, that are always the same. You can say, oh, here's where the protease is going to cleave. Not true for the HIV protease. So we're talking about all these rates. We're talking about cleavages at specific sites. These are proteins that have you know, hundreds of amino acids, and yet there's only a, a few cleavage sites. Um, and so it's fair to ask, well, what determines a site? And we're going to address that question, and we're going to tie it in with what determines the rate of the site. And what I'm actually going to tell you is that the first part of the talk is that we've taken what I'm excited about as kind of a first step in understanding what determines the rate. And the reason I'm excited about that is because if you look at these sites, um, you don't even have to know what the amino acid code is. I, the slash is where the, the cleavage event is going to take place. But what's pretty obvious is there's not much similarity between those sequences. It's not like they line up on top of each other. There's a huge amount of diversity in these sites. Um, so one thing I can point out is that the P1 position upstream is usually a hydrophobic amino acid. Not always, but usually. And then this is the point I wanted to make about the P1 prime. Here you can see proline. And then other ones are non-proline. And they're usually hydrophobic. So uh, about all you can say is that the protease likes to find hydrophobic sequences. That's sort of the first pass of the code, which is not very satisfying. Um, I have a close colleague, uh, Celia Schiffer, who's a crystallographer, who has done the crystallography of these proteins in an inactive protease. And what you see is that they form a nice sort of regular up and down structure, which we refer to as a beta sheet. Um, and they all fall on top of each other. Here you can see the, the names of the side chains. They alternate up and down. Um, so we know that the conformation, what the conformation looks like in the protease. We know that the spacer peptide negatively regulates the cleavage and trying to understand why these things differ in rates. Here you can see the, the numbering of the orders. And we notice that RNA actually works on the protease to increase its activity, at least in an, an assay. But these are the types of things we know about, about how it controls rate. And it's not very satisfying to look at this list of very disparate sequences and be able to glean any information about, about, about the different rates. So we ask the question, to what extent are the cleavage rates determined by these sequences? Here I gave you an example where the flanking sequence controls the rate of cleavage. But is that generalizable, or is that kind of a specific case? So, we're going to isolate these sequences by themselves and try to determine what controls the rate. How does the protease interact with these sequences to cleave some fast and some slow? What is it that the protease is looking for? So Mark Patempa did a, uh, was a graduate student who did most of this work. And the system was set up by a senior researcher in the lab, Suk Young Lee. And what we did was we made two substrates that had the same cleavage site here between matrix and capsid. This is a deleted form of capsid. Here's another matrix capsid with the full length size of capsid. For this one, we act, act, added some stuff upstream. And the effect was to make products after you cleaved here either big or small. Big or small. So we could separate them on a gel. We would have big products and small products. And these products down here were labeled, fluorescently labeled, just made them more sensitive to detect in the gel. So after cleave, this would be where we would stain for all other proteins, but uh, when we use this fluorescent tag, we would just see the, the precursors um, and the product. Actually, that's what these are. These are the precursors and the products. So we would start with these two things and then generate these two things. And the idea was that we could use these viral proteins or make globular proteins and then replace the, um, the amino acids at the cleavage site. And so that's what this looks like. So here are the, some of the cleavage sites. And we would move them into this position right here and replace the normal cleavage site. And we kind of made it a little bit more artificial to try to isolate the sequence so we could 
look at the effect of sequence on rate by putting in a little bit of a, a linker here, these glycines that are very flexible. So we put in three glycines, a cleavage site, and three glycines. Now, remember that we have two substrates. Oops. We have two substrates that we are going to mix. So one substrate, um, oh, it's really mad at me. Hello. OK, it's not going to go back. But remember, we have two substrates. We have a big one and a small one. Uh, so we can keep one constant. One always has the normal cleavage site, which is this one right here. And then the other substrate has all the ones we want to test. And we put them together, and we look at the relative rates of cleavage. So the extra one going faster, the extra one going slower. It took out a lot of variables, and we just had to measure the relative rates of cleavage, which made it much simpler for us. So this is a big chunk of Mark's thesis, the approximately 150 cleavages. A zero change in the rate means that it's just like the matrix caps at normal site. And you can see that some things got better, some things got worse. And overall, only about 10% of the changes we made gave better sites, and uh, more than half of them made them worse. And now the different sites alone are in here, so we would consider those not mutated, and they're kind of color-coded. And so there, and you can see the, somewhere in here is the, the green site, and some things would make it better, and some things would make it worse. But it, the different sites are color-coded. Um, so you can see that, that this is now our data set. So now um, I have to show you a really confusing slide, and I apologize. Um, but it's our attempt to try to understand it, and it's going through this matrix that um, we're going to come to understand what's going on. So these are six sites that we put in to be cleaved. And then these are the mutants that we put in. Now, the ones that are together represent double mutants, and we can ignore those. But so for example, here at P4, the wild type amino acid is the one that's in bold, which uh, I guess is an alanine, maybe. And then these are all the substitutions and the full change. And so you can see that. There was relatively small change. It didn't really matter what we put in there. Didn't make it better, but it only made it a little bit worse. So we have this for six sites. And, and you know, we were staring at this and going nuts. We didn't know how to do this. Um, we thought, you know, here's the, the one, one of the ones in matrix capsid that has this proline in here. And we thought, well, should we separate these out to understand these separately? But there's another one over here that has proline. And, trying to do uh, sort of correlation analysis because we had all these the rate information. And it was just hard and not very satisfying. And then Mark said two things that really helped us focus on understanding what was going on. He said, you know, the matrix capsid, which is this one that has a P1 prime proline, that's going to be, become the end terminus of capsid. And it has to be proline because it's got to make this fold back hairpin to change this conformation. He said, you know, if you look at the, the, all the mutations I made, none of them made it better. And that was sort of a light that went off that said, well, what if we assume that this is actually optimal, even though it's not the fastest? If you put a proline at this position, maybe you can't do, excuse me, do any better than that. So that was helpful. And then he said the same thing about the fastest site, SP1NC, which is down here. And you'll see here are two hydrophobic amino acids, methionine and methionine, at the cleavage site. And he said, you know, I can't make this one any better either. Everything I put in made it worse. So that was the other class of sites. And that was sort of the other shoe falling, that maybe if we should started with the point that these two are as good as you can get, what is it about those that makes them good? And what is it that makes these other ones not as good? And, and what's the pattern that makes things worse? And then he said something else, which was, you know, P2 and P2 prime seem really important. And that was sort of by process of elimination. If you look, these outer positions, P3, P4, P3 prime, P4 prime, for the most part, there aren't big changes in the rates of cleavage. Sometimes, but for the most part, not. So it doesn't look like they're major determinants of the rate. But if you look at these inner four amino acids, and we're not surprised that the amino acids flanking the cleavage side are important, but the ones at P1 and P2, P2 and P2 prime, though, 
contribute a lot to the rate. They can have big effects on the rate. So this then became kind of our attack strategy to figure out what was going on. So, and here's the, you just look inside these red boxes. That's where all the action is going on in terms of things going up and down in a big way. So that, that really helped. And so we started to unravel this code then. And um, what I want you to see is that here's the proline, and here's the tyrosine, the cleavage event goes on here. Um, you know, if you put in a small amino acid, that's bad, but I, I don't really want to focus on the, these two guys other than point out that there's a proline here. And there's a asparagine here, and you can't do better than asparagine. If you put in other amino acids, it gets worse. And specifically, if you put in these hydrophobic amino acids, valine and isoleucine, it gets really bad. So for this P2 position, when you have proline here, you'd say asparagine is much better than these hydrophobic amino acids. So let's go to the other side, P2 prime. There's, there's a little bit of a gradient here that'll get bigger later, with other sites, but you can see that isoleucine, which is this hydrophobic amino acid, is similar to, but a little bit better than these two hydrophilic amino acids, uh, glutamic acid and glutamine. So this is actually, these two are sort of, in terms of the chemistry of the amino acids, mirror images of each other. Hydrophilic, better than hydrophobic. Hydrophobic, better than hydrophilic, okay? So now let's look at this one, and this is with proline in P1 prime. Now let's look at this one where you have two hydrophobic amino acids, not proline, at the cleavage site. Look at P2, we see that isoleucine and valine are really good, and asparagine is a hundredfold worse, just the opposite of what's over here. So it likes the hydrophobic amino acids, hates the asparagine, and now over here, the glutamine and glutamic acid, the charged ones, are good, and the isoleucine is bad, okay? Just the opposite of what's over here. The charged ones are good, or polar ones, and the hydrophobic ones are bad. Mirror images. So this seems like a big hint, and in, in fact it is. And the one thing I'll ask you to do in looking at this structure is ignore this guy. We can come back to it later, but this little thing that says P2 asparagine, just ignore that for right now and I promise you we'll come back. And these are not, one of these is the same site as this, the one in magenta here. We don't really have this, but we do have a pretty good representation except for that. And what I want you to see is that in the, the asparagine in this, when proline is over here, which is not shown, but the asparagine is pointing away, okay? And the valine in this other site where valine is better than asparagine, the valine is pointing in. And it's just the opposite over here. This glutamic acid, or actually it's the same rather, the glutamic acid and the glutamine, which are charged, are pointing away. When you have a hydrophobic amino acid, when it's the best, it's actually pointing on the inside. And we can see why that is. Again, these are from Celia Schiffer, who made all these structures. Here's the asparagine interacting with asparagines over here, the spartic, or spartic acids rather. So these nice polar interactions that include interactions with the, the side chain, whereas the, the valine is interacting with these very hydrophobic amino acids. So you have a subsite, this is all the P2 subsite, that's in fact bifunctional. It's hydrophilic over here, hydrophobic over here, and the same thing happens over here. Hydrophobic on the inside, hydrophilic on the outside. And the orientation of the amino acids is determined and whether or not you have a proline at P1 prime. So, so does the steric fit matter? Like, what if you put bigger hydrophobic, like, uh, you know, tryptophan or something in there? So, so um, we haven't done it. I suspect there's a limit. Um, we figured this out after we generated 150 mutants. So questions like that represent the follow-up, and we're, we're trying to minimize the number that we have to do before we send this out. Um, uh, what I can say is you don't see any variability if you look at a thousand gag sequences. You don't see variability like that. So it doesn't certainly select it against uh, naturally. Okay, so let's look at a couple sites now. The other sites that we tested. Um, so here you have two hydrophobic amino acids. 
but you have an asparagine, this N, uh, as the normal amino acid. And that should go with the proline here. But that's, that's the naturally occurring amino acid. Well, if you swap out that asparagine for isoleucine, the rate goes way up. Okay, so that asparagine is in fact slowing down the rate of cleavage here. And here you have a glutamine, um, and then you see that it gets a little bit better with uh, glutamic acid, so it really likes it, the acid form over uh, the, the glutamine form. And the isoleucine is um, okay there. It doesn't make it any too, very much worse, but sort of this relationship where the, the higher charge is better. But the asparagine is really out of place. Now let's look over here um, where we see that there's, again, hydrophobic amino acids, although alanine is really suboptimal for, it's a really small amino acid. But we can see now that um, the valine and the isoleucine are good. And now consistent with the absence of the proline here, the asparagine is just terrible. And over here, the expected um, hydrophilic amino acid. And we see now with a suboptimal P1 prime, it really does like the same way this was a little bit better over here. Now it's a whole lot better over the, the glutamine. And we don't have an isoleucine, but my guess is that it would not hardly cleave at all. That's a prediction that we need to test. And then, uh, let's see, are these the, so that, that um, oh, so this asparagine here, this is the one I told you we'd come back to, is in fact this guy here. So instead of pointing over here, it's now pointing in the direction where the valine wants to go into this hydrophobic area and becomes very limiting. And as soon as you swap it out with isoleucine, it probably fills up the space much more in a much better interaction. Okay, so now the, the last two sites, um, when you put in, have a proline here with now a serine, kind of the wrong amino acid, you can see that asparagine suddenly does a much better job. Um, and then over here on the other side though, uh, the veil, it's got a glutamine, but because there's a proline here, you'd expect to see the hydrophobic amino acid, and you can see now that the valine is actually better than the, the other two charged amino acids. And then over here, um, let's just skip this one, it's, but let's go over here and uh, so now, what did we learn? We learned that the fastest and the best protease cleavage site has a large P1 hydrophobic amino acid right here um, with a hydrophobic P2 amino acid pointing towards the sisal bond and a hydrophilic P2 prime pointing away. Okay, so that's the best cleavage site you can make. But because the virus has to accommodate this proline here in at least one site for sure, but it seems to show up in other sites, it switches the use of these two amino acids where now the P2 amino acid is pointing away on, and the P2 prime is pointing in, completely reversing the use of these, these uh, S2 and S2 prime uh, subsites, which means that they have to be bifunctional. They have to have a hydrophilic side and a hydrophobic side to accommodate both types of cleavage because you have to be able to cleave with a proline at P1 prime. And then what we see is that slights with slower rates of cleavage, which occur naturally, can be improved as you move towards one of these two prototypes. Okay, so that's the code. That's the, sort of the first level of code. I'm sure as we try to explain everything, there'll be as many exceptions as there are rules, but that seems to be a way to come to understand how the protease can optimize cleavage and have a proline at P1 prime. Rob, in structural terms, do you understand why the code No, and I've been trying to, to get Celia to think harder about it. I, she's given me an answer that I don't like and I can't accept. <laughs> so I, I, out of respect that she's probably right, I won't say what I think is going on. But I would love, what you don't see here is kind of a torque in this right. back. I mean, that's what you, like say, oh, it's forcing it to point that way. And I haven't gotten that answer out of her yet. Um, so how many people know what this is? Is that canyon lands? Yeah, so it's your a wonderful salt dome that you have erupting up, and you can walk around this and walk into it. So, part of our.
tour guide by her, her, our phase transition into the next question. Um, so this is a, you know, I, I really shouldn't, you know, I shouldn't do this. Um, I'm going to skip this. But the, I'll just tell you what the answer is. It's actually been published by several people, but it's so fun. Um, you can tell how many enzymes are needed for replication as you titrate out the protease activity because the big precursors aren't active for their, as enzymes. So if you titrate out the protease activity, they don't get, all get cleaved, so you reduce the number of enzymes in the virion, and you can use it, uh, inhibitors to say, oh, you only need one of these, or you need lots of these. And so that's the take-home message here. And actually, the funnest part is uh, AZT, which terminates the chain, but doesn't translocate, and it has different properties than the other tra chain terminators. And it has to do with which, uh, which reverse transcriptase molecule puts the AZT on and which one takes it off. OK. So who knows what this is? Yeah, You guys get around. <laughs> um, these are wonderful places in your state. OK, so let me finish up with this last story. Um, so remember, we have the, these rates of cleavage. And now we're going to ask, how important is each one of these cleavage events? Um, and so there's all the, the sequences. And what I'm going to point out is that the P1 amino acid, so the one just upstream is with the exception of this guy, which is also a terrible cleavage site. And looking at that asparagine, it's easy to understand. Um, but they all have these hydrophobic amino acids. But they don't have one kind of hydrophobic amino acid, and that's um, it includes isoleucine and valine, which are very hydrophobic. But um, there are these amino acids that are beta branched. And I should have put a picture up, but, but they're kind of specialized beta branched amino acids that are otherwise hydrophobic and would be perfectly fine. But because of their structure, they just gum up the works around the cleavage site. And so it turns out you can place isoleucine or valine at this position and make it an non-cleavable site. It's, it's as if you had a drug that would inhibit that cleavage site. So you can do site-specific inhibition of cleavage. Okay, so we have all these different cleavage sites, and we can knock them out one at a time, leave fusion proteins behind. Okay, so that's what we did. And we were specifically interested in knowing which sites are most important. And I'll show you how we were able to use it like a drug in a titration experiment. But these are now all the cleavage sites, and these are the positions of the mutants. And if you look at the virion proteins, um, it's not quite as clean as you would like, but let's just take, for example, here, if you block the cleavage site at matrix and capsid, which is really going to be the heart of our story, uh, that's this mutant right here. And you can see a fusion protein using this uh, in the virus particles that doesn't exist in the wild type hardly at all. But so normally, you would get cleavage here. If you block the site, you wind up with this product and none of the processed protein here. And you can, to the extent we had the right antibodies, you can kind of work that out for all the different variants. OK? And then, um, oops. Oh, this is very exciting for me here. Um, yeah, what I wanted to show you here was that uh, when you block a site with one exception, which is this really crummy site anyway, the virus is essentially dead. So you have to cleave these sites to make an infectious particle. And that's not a, not a very surprising outcome. Um, then what we did, uh, so we, can, we make these viruses by taking the clone DNA, throwing it on the cells, and it produces particles. So when we use the wild type, we get out wild type virus. When we use the mutant, we get out all mutant virus. And that's sort of the extremes here. Here's the wild type, uh, and then here's the mutant. But what happens if we mix them? It's a genetic term called phenotypic mixing, but you can add half and half. You can add 90, 10. You can make any mixture you want, and you can make particles where 90% of the site is cleaved, but 10% isn't, for example. And so you can ask, how important is cleavage at this site? How far does it have to go to make a virus particle infection? So, here you can see these are the titrations we did by mixing them. But then the real question is, as you add in this drug, this uncleavable site, 
that's specific for each site one at a time, how does that in affect infectivity? And so this kind of messy graph here is still color-coded. And so what you see is that here's the wild type. That's our 100% infectivity. Here's the mutant down here. No infectivity except for this one site. Um, we included actually the protease mutant itself in here. And you know, all I want you to see in this part of the graph is that they all go down. So in the same way that you have to have uh, some cleavage, if you block cleavage altogether, they're dead. You can have intermediate amounts of infectivity as you put in mixtures of the wild type and the uncleavable mutant. But look at this red line. This is the one that made the experiment worthwhile. By the time you get to 10, 20% mutant, the virion is completely dead. So that kind of got our attention. And this happens to be the one between matrix and capsid. Okay, so remember that matrix is attached to the membrane, capsid's going to form the virus particle after it gets cleaved and then reform. And so just to remind you, um, you have this precursor that's going to get cleaved. So here's the one conformation of capsid. And it's two domains. And then looking just at this domain, you reform all of this stuff to bring this new cleaved end terminus, the P1 proline, down to this salt bridge and creating these new interfaces. And again, this is all Wes's work. Uh, what, these are Wes's slides. <laughs> and hopefully, uh, probably this from long ago, and these, these folks are gone. But, um, but what you can see is that they've drawn uh, these cart well, models of how the capsid protein with the N-terminal blue domain and the C-terminal yellow domain, and, and then actually the little tail that comes off the end in the n cleave form, they're in one conformation. And then you can see that after the, the, this part is cleaved off, they, um, and, and the, also the N-terminus of the capsid is released, they're in a, a significantly different conformation in the mature, mature protein looking down from the top or at the side it, it, without knowing what the details are which is Wes's purview, uh, it's easy to see that they're very different. And it has to do with how the capsid protein rearranges itself after the cleavage event. So what happens when we titrate in, as a drug, this uncleavable site? So here's the completely thin section EM of a budding virus particle. This is a cartoon of it. I had to change the color code a little bit. So the red is the matrix here along the membrane. The pink is the capsid, and then the NC protein is in here. So if you don't cleave anything at all, everything's still stuck on the membrane, which now is yellow, uh, and you get this nice dark uh, electron-dense material along the membrane. And so if you then allow cleavage, remember you have two extra excess cleavage capsid protein that then some of it, half of it about, reassembles into this cone, and so you have this kind of dark background of unused capsid and this cone, and here's not a great EM of it, but there's a cone, and there's actually some electron-dense material here. The stuff on the membrane is now not as thick because it's all been, except for the matrix protein, it's all been cleaved off. If you put in just the mutant, so we're going to leave the matrix and the capsid stuck together, 100%. You get this. So you now have more electron-dense material because you still have matrix and capsid. You have a nice clear background because there's no extra capsid protein. It's still all on the membrane. And now you can see the RNA in the nuclear capsid as the central thing that's collapsed on itself with no structure, but a totally uninfectious particle. And then now, what happens if we titrate in just a little bit of our drug? How, how did we make a virus particle that was dead with only 20% uncleaved capsid? And here's what it looks like. And here's the, at least the cartoon rendition. What we see is that this this electron-dense thing, which would normally be inside the cone, the RNA and the nucleic acid would be inside. Here it collapses because there's no capsid around it. Here, not only did it collapse on itself, but it's now stuck in the membrane. And you know, with a little imagination, you can see some messy structures in here that might be attempts of the, the uh, capsid proteins to organize into some types of structures that are totally aberrant. So, what we can say then, what it looks like, is that this residual fusion protein, this MACA fusion protein that we put in it, in this case only 20%, <coughs> the virus particle is completely dead. And the features that we see is that the nucleocapsid core is now apparently tethered to the membrane. 
and that potentially there are attempts at cone formation that are totally poisoned, that just give aberrant structures. So that's how this thing, it's really the bad apple in the barrel. A little bit of this thing is apparently able to participate in capsid formation, which should give a cone, but it poisons it and just sends it off in some multiple aberrant directions and totally non-infectious. So we were pretty excited about this. We had a substrate that was labeled with fluorescein and it was big and when we cleaved it with protease, the fluorescein tag was smaller and this is now something that you can use fluorescence polarization to measure big things versus little things. So we had an assay for doing high throughput screening and NIH was kind enough to pay for a screen of 700,000 compounds and we're working on the screens and I don't think this is a hit, but it's the type of thing we're looking for. Here's the control, the substrate getting cleaved by the protease over time. And in the presence of one of these compounds that were in the middle of screening, you can see that it pretty much inhibits cleavage. Here's a control substrate uh, with a different sequence in a different place, the cleavage of the, uh, in the control. And you see a little bit of inhibition here, some inhibition, it's not as good as this, but hopefully it will be different from this and we'll be able to have at least the first hints of specificity that we're inhibiting the matrix capsid site over the uh, alternative site and we would really have a drug that could target that site. And I should point out that there is a drug that targets another site that actually made it to the clinic, but this is our attempt to find an inhibition of that site specifically. And because it's so potent, even a small part amount of this fusion protein is able to poison the whole assembly process. This seems like the right one to target. So I, that's it for me. I thank you. I apologize for going too far. <laughs> uh, I do want to thank Suk Young Lee, who's still in the lab, Mark Patempa, who left, and I showed Amy's doing the titrations. And I really have to thank the people at SRI who's doing, who are doing the screening, but Celia Schiffer has been a long time collaborator and people in her lab been really important to our work in this area. So, thank you. Questions? Yes? Um, is that particular type of site so specific to this virus that um, you don't anticipate side effects? Um, well, I mean, the, when you're screening 700,000 compounds, who knows? And they, the side effects come in lots of different forms. Usually screens like this at best give you a, a structure that might have some specificity and then the medicinal chemists take over and, and try everything under the sun and the chance that it would turn into a drug is actually pretty small, but it could be a, an interesting tool for later experiments. Yeah, Wes. So now, now you know there are these Alini compounds that give these eccentric cores, and I guess one interpretation of that is that integrase is involved in some sort of an initiation site for capsid assembly. Um, can that also be part of your story? So the, in those cases, the capsid misses the RNP particle and fails to nucleate around it. Yeah, there, um, maybe. It may be that once the capsid starts trying to oligomerize, there's no other place for the nucleic capsid core to go except to the side. That, yeah, that's possible. I thought of that. Yeah. So this is so timely. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's really great. I mean, the, so, uh, do you really expect these rates to be very different in I don't ex no. I don't expect them to be. Well, I mean, um, as I said earlier, we, I think we got these really fast rates in this one system. They're not as fast here. Um, we're not in the context of the protein because we put in these glycine linkers. So the, the truth is somewhere in there, but I don't know exactly where. And again, I don't know, I don't know how, I know that if the, uh, there, was, there was an experiment where um, SP1 was cut out, and those viruses are dead. So whatever regulation SP1 is supposed to confer, either structurally mm -hmm. or in retaining, restraining the rate, that was lost. Um, 
But we just, and it, you can see that for some of the sites, it's hard to make them better. You can't make them better, but we will be able to slow down some sites, mm -hmm. um, but I don't know what the effect will be. Uh, and I don't know what, it goes, what goes on in the virion. Yes? So is there a biological function for the different rates? And is there just, se you can establish yeah. the sequence of the cell? That, and that, that's, yeah, that, I'm struggling with that answer and in, in, uh, trying to, um, I think we just, until we start to manipulate these rates in the virus particle in a convincing way, I don't really know. I do find it very odd that the virus intentionally makes slow sites because we were easily able to improve some of those sites. So it makes me think that, in fact, that when we measure differences in rates, that must be important to the virus. And, but we haven't, haven't used this information yet to now change the rates. And I think before this, we wouldn't have known how to change the rates. So, yeah. so maybe, Mr. Scott, when you improve the cleavage of the slow sites, what was the consequence? So that, so that's, uh, yeah, this is the $64,000 question. Actually, when $64,000 used to be a lot of money. <laughs> uh, and we don't know yet, so, but that's, that's something so, that we need so to I do. So another question yeah. is, um, since the protease is the, the unique enzyme that makes all the cleavages, um, what mechanism do you propose or do you expect to find when you find a drug that um, blocks that cleavage yeah. more specifically? So Bavirmet somehow binds near the cleavage site, and presumably holds, you know, alters its structure. Um, who knows? So I make these things, you know, every, everybody who does drug design wants to bind into a pocket, and we don't, we know of no pocket here. So the things I fantasize about are, you know, if you were to bind to this extended linker region in a way that induced, just either blocked it or induced some type of structure that could block cleavage, if you could bring matrix and capsid closer together, if you had sort of a bifunctional something that held them together and created a loop that was very um, uh, poor substrate, that could do it. So, but I, th I think when you when you get to screen seven hundred thousand compounds, you don't have to have an idea. It, 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 the idea that comes out might be totally unrelated to anything that you could even imagine, and so so that's. I, I'm not, I don't have to trust my imagination, and I certainly can't depend on my ability to design drugs to figure that one out. So, so it's a total guess. Yeah. So yeah. I'm going to ask the stupid question. Yeah. Yeah. But, um, so you, when you were testing the different constructs for cleavage, you had a GST tag on there, which tends to dimerize. And so that got me thinking that in the virus, you've got them stacked next to each other. So should I be thinking of this cleavage in the context of a single molecule, or should I be thinking of it in the context of cleavage in the yeah. ensemble Yeah, what cells? do you think, Savit? <laughs> I'm going, you know, contrary to my life, is extremely I'm going to be the ensemble. Well, I'm just, I, <laughs> yeah, no, 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 no that's, that's, a, that's, a, that's a really fundamental question. It, yeah, it, it's one of those stupid questions that gets at right at the heart of the matter. Um, and so we, and we don't know. We don't know when the protease is activated relative to what the structures that are formed. Uh, presumably, we, you know, we like to think it's a late stage, which presents lots of challenges for this protease getting up and down these assembled things to make cleavages and what the rates are. Um, now, those are, those are really hard questions in the, in the context of the virus. So was that the motivation for putting a GST bag on there? Uh, it was just to make it bigger. Oh, okay. Because we wanted to separate, we wanted to have two substrates and two products that were all, that are all the different sizes, so we could run them internally. That's all, and and it's you know it's possible. Well, what we did show was that the two forms of the substrates had the with the same site had the same cleavage rate, so we didn't introduce any artifacts that changed the rate of cleavage. For okay, all right. Thank you all very much. You've been really great. <laughs> Why don't you the physics part of the